Okay, so the cardiac muscle. Now, what did I say? So let's think about this. I said the top of the heart contracts simultaneously, both of those atria, lub, and then the two ventricles, a very short time later, less than a second later, the two ventricles contract dub. So that's confusing, maybe. You might be thinking, what on earth is going on here? How can we have the two parts of the heart operating independently of each other? And so, so here on this slide, which is labeled cardiac muscle, we say that um, the contraction of the heart is myogenic. And that means it is generated by the heart muscle itself. And we're gonna talk about there is a location in that right atrium where, where the heartbeat is generated. And so you say, well, and so, and what it does is it starts the contraction and that spreads across the top of the heart. Well, it ends up that we have a, a, um, a, a skeleton, a, a con what do we call it? It's not really a skeleton. It's a connective tissue separation between the two atria and the two ventricles. So separating the two atria and the two ventricles, we have, we have a connective tissue layer that isolates the two groups of, of cardiac muscle. Now, do you remember from a and P1, we talked about how cardiac muscle communicated together. And um, we had said, what does it talk about? <laughs> they don't have really, they don't really have conversations, but what it means is that one muscle cell shares its chemistry with the next. And we had said, we had these little openings called gap junctions. And as soon as one of those atrial well, if we talk about the atrium, one of those little cardiocytes, one of those little cardiac muscles, as soon as that one starts to contract, that chemistry spreads to the next one, causing it to contract, which, you know, spreads to the next, the next, the next. And next thing you know, all of the atrium is contracting together. We have a way of carrying that signal, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, down to the bottom of the the two ventricles. So we get the two atria contracting basically simultaneously. We then have this cardiac conduction pathway, which we'll talk about next time, which carries the signal down here to the apex of the heart. And then the same thing happens. As soon as one of those cardiac muscle cells starts to contract, it spreads to the next, to the next, to the next. And next thing you know, both of those ventricles are contracting approximately simultaneous. So you get lub, dub, lub, dub. So the term that we use for these functional groups of cardiac muscle cells is called a syncytium. I know. We always have these crazy words. So we have an atrial syncytium. And what's the other one? Ventricular ventricular syncytium. And what we're saying is as soon as one of those cardiac muscle cells in the atrial syncytium starts to contract, it communicates with all the rest of them. And then as soon as one of the ventricular cardiac muscle cells starts to contract, it communicates with the others and all the rest of them do the same. So this is how the two parts of the heart contract at slightly different times lub dub lub dub that's fun yeah lub dub right no it's not fun anyway uh, <laughs> um let's move on ahead so we had said this is a little bit of review from cardiac muscle we had said that um the two cardiocytes the cardio cardiac muscle cells where they come together instead of just having a straight membrane it's a wavy membrane and that's so that you have more surface area because these cardiocytes, 
these cardiac muscle cells, they have to contract throughout life. You're, through your entire life, they're, you know, lub dubbing, lub dub. You know, it's like rowing a boat, but you never get a break. So, so and, and so you, they have to be tied together very tightly. And we had said the way they communicate with each other was through openings that are called gap junctions. Now, I'd said that we have a coronary blood circulation, right? And maybe you heard when somebody's had a heart attack, they said, oh my God, they had a coronary. Mm -hmm. It's talking about coronary arteries. And in lab, you're gonna be learning all these little teeny tiny, and in here, <laughs> all these little teeny tiny arteries that make up the coronary circulation. And they look kind of insignificant, but if you get a blockage in one of them, what happens? The heart muscle dies. It's not a good thing. Um, and so then when we had talked about tissue um, repair, we'd said we have two different ways that tissues can be repaired. We have regeneration, it's all good as new, or by scarring fibrosis. In the heart, you don't have regeneration. You have fibrosis, scarring. So, and scars don't contract very well. And so that's why when people have a heart attack, their heart efficiency drops way down because the dead cardiac muscle cells are replaced by scar tissue. Yeah, not a good thing. Okay. Now, when I was talking, about the pathway of the blood through the heart. I mentioned two of the valves. Well, there's actually four, um, but there's one kind of valve that is called a um, atrioventricular valve. And those are the ones that I identified. I said the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves. And, and when you look at them, they look a little bit like a parachute. So it's a, we have like a triangular parachute, kind of like that, except it's triangular. And underneath it, that's my mask. It's not a, not a heart valve, it's a mask. And underneath it, we have little strings that are attached to the heart muscle. Uh, and so the parachute part is a cusp. And then the little string below is called a chordae tendinae. Yeah, that's what we call that like the parachute cords would be the chordae tendinae. And you know what they attach to? Yeah, to the muscle, but there are little things that extend up, little portions of muscle that are called papillary muscle that pull down, they pull down on the chordae tendinae. And so, so when, so what, is, what do these valves do? Why do you have them? So we had said the blood is pumped down into the ventricles and then the ventricles contract and the valves keep the blood from going back up into the atria. It wouldn't do any good if the blood went down, up, down, up, down, up. It needs to go from the top down and then from the ventricles out, right? And so we have valves that prevent backflow. And so we have these tricuspid valve on the right side and bicuspid valve on the left side. And they're made up of those three parts. The cusp, it's like a parachute. The chordae tendinae, it's like a string. And the little papillary muscles, which are part of the heart muscle. And so when, when the ventricles are contracting, the papillary muscles pull down and keep keep the cusp from uh, blowing backwards and allowing blood to go back into the two atria. And on the right side, tricuspid, left side, bicuspid, also known as mitral. Okay. We also have valves at the base of the two arteries that I mentioned. So if you remember on the right side, I said the blood is pumped out of the right side of the heart into what we call the pulmonary trunk. And right at the base of that pulmonary trunk, 
we have valves. And what do they do? They prevent backflow just like those atrioventricular valves that I was just talking about. So it's, but these are, they're not nearly as complicated. It all it consists of are three cusp. There's just three parachute things, <laughs> three little things to prevent the backflow. And so we call them semilunar. We have one of them at the base of the pulmonary trunk, and we have one of them right here at the base of the aorta. The one at the base of the pulmonary trunk, you know what we call it? The pulmonary semilunar valve. And the one at the base of the aorta? Mm -hmm. Aortic semilunar valve. So there you have it. That's pretty darn easy, right? And in both cases, these valves prevent backflow. Okay, so I mentioned, here we are on slide eight. It says, this is the skeleton of the heart. And we had said that those valves, you know, I, I mentioned, I said we had the tricuspid valve, the, the bicuspid valve, those were the atrioventricular valves with all the pieces and parts. And then we had had the, the two different semilunar valves. Well, they're embedded in that um, that connective tissue skeleton that's separating the atria from the two ventricles. And so this fibrous ring, not only is it separating those two different groups of cardiac muscle cells, it's also the attachment site, the really strong attachment site for those four different valves. The two atrioventricular valves, tricuspid and bicuspid, and the two semilunar valves, pulmonary semilunar and aortic semilunar valves. So we have three functions for this fibrous skeleton, connective tissue skeleton of the heart. It gives the heart some structure. It makes it stronger. Ah. It, so it makes it stronger. It also is an attachment site for those those valves for the four valves and what did we say it separates the two atria from those two ventricles it insulates prevents them the signal from spreading uh, down so that you can get the two atria pushing blood down into the ventricles prior to them squirting it out to the rest of your body All right, I'm gonna come back and we're gonna talk about those little bitty arteries on the surface of the heart.